We have a quorum. So I'm going to start the meeting. Uh, welcome to the joint meeting for the Rules and Open Government Committee and Committee of the Whole. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Arenas? Cohen? Yeah. Davis? Perales? Here. Jones? Present. Thank you. And can Tony, can you let Sylvia in? She's a. Uh, yes. Cindy. And, and it looks like Dev is also on. I'm here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. All right. On to the first agenda, which is for Tuesday, October 26th. And we are going to start out on pages four and five. Six and seven. Eight and nine. 10 and 11, 12 and 13, 14, And that's it. And we're going to go to the public first for public comments. First public speaker is Tessa. Go ahead, Tessa. All right. Good afternoon, Vice Mayor and Council. Thank you for having this time for us to speak. And the item that I'm talking about is that whole issue with our um, the Columbus Park and our issues with homelessness and, um, you know, issues of, of that. And the issue that we're looking at is um, that we need to, we have to re rehouse these people. It's, I guess, a federal law or whatever it is, Supreme Court decision that we have to do that. So we have an urgency to do that. And on top of it, I'm very supportive of, of, of growing food in that area. And one of the issues that my husband mentioned is that we could have solar panels over the whole 40 acres and that the solar panels can allow uh, um, light in so we can grow food. And so that actually would protect the birds most likely from getting into the food and maybe they would stay away. So that's something to think about. And then in addition, the most other important thing, because we have to save the people as our highest priority, is that we have this land at 615 that actually a, um, a property owner is willing to sell. You know, and how many times do we have property owners willing to sell and it's a third of an acre? And what the idea is, is that we would build a school for the, for the um, home arts, and we would have uh, 30, 35 homeless people that would apply for this school and to live in this, this building with teachers. And so it would be 35 teachers and 35, and we have three buildings to do that. And it would be, the buildings would all be fossil fuel free, that we would build them, you know, to do that. And then on top of it, they would be learning to live fossil fuel free. And they would, it would be providing a community garden there. And so it would be job training for them to grow food. And then they learning to live without fossil fuels, without waste, which is, which is, which is um, processing our food. So we, we can our own food, things like that. We learn to be vegan. We learn to no plastic. So we could take in a lot of monies from a lot of different institutions to support this type of development. So that's my suggestion. Thank you. Person with the number ending in 3157. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. This is Sarah Armstrong. I represent Americans for Safe Access. And I'm calling in today to talk about the uh, October 26 agenda item which would stop medical cannabis patients from being able to use cannabis in their homes because the proposed ordinance would outlet, 
outlaw it. This is a, a matter of grave concern, as you can imagine, because per state law, medical cannabis patients cannot medicate in public anywhere. Therefore, if you outlaw the ability of them to medicate in their homes, you have destroyed safe access for the sick and dying. The Compassionate Use Act, Act of 1996 is still in force, and uh, it mandated that seriously ill Californians have a right to obtain and use medical marijuana for medical purposes, and that they should not be subject to criminal prosecution or sanctions as a result of this use, it's still good law. Therefore, we, our organization would ask that you consult with your legal advisors and uh, perhaps think about the uh, implications of destroying safe access for people who are terminally ill. People who are uh, fighting stage four cancer should not have to face eviction when they could easily work with the landlord to find solutions that would allow them to medicate without inconveniencing other tenants. Thank you for your consideration. We will shortly be sending out a memo to you all outlining what we've said. And we hope that the city of San Jose will continue to show compassion for the sick and dying by honoring state law and allowing people to medicate in their homes. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Go ahead, Sean. Good afternoon, Council Member. Sean Kelly Rye. Uh, I just wanted to speak about item 7.2 on the October 26th agenda, smoke-free housing. Uh, essentially, it's a smoke, it's a de facto ban on cannabis use for San Jose residents, especially those in multifamily unit dwellings, and especially those that are lower income. Um, I had sent a letter to a number of uh, committee members uh, yesterday evening from attorney Tamara Todd, who wrote about California's Adult Use of Marijuana Act, Prop 64, and how it clearly allows local governments to treat cannabis differently from tobacco. Um, what uh, Sarah said uh, regarding Prop 215 also allows a private use of medical cannabis and is protected under California's medical marijuana law. Uh, Scientific evidence is also clear that cannabis does not present a secondhand smoke hazard like tobacco. This is not a statement I'm making. I'm not a doctor, but I can send you a letter from UCSF expert, Dr. Donald Abrams. Unlike tobacco, not a single study has found secondhand cannabis smoke or vaping to be harmful to human health. Unlike tobacco, even firsthand cannabis smoking has been not shown to cause lung cancer or cardiovascular disease in humans. And, and, and I'm just going to give you the title of the gentleman that wrote that. It's Dr. Uh, Abrams, MD, Professor Emeritus of Medicine, University of California, San Francisco, immediate past chief, hematology and oncology. Uh, finally, uh, as the law center had mentioned, uh, this, uh, uh, this ordinance is unfortunately going to disproportionately affect uh, people of lower income and minority residents. The Silicon Valley Law Alliance uh, foundation, pardon me, uh, has mentioned this in their letter, and then I'd also spoken with, and also Dr. Armeline from the San Jose Human Rights Institute has submitted a letter to this effect. Uh, this requires much more study and should be deferred and referred to economic development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Blair? Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, happy Rules and open, open Government Day. There's about three or four items on this agenda that are of interest to myself. Uh, one is, uh, they're kind of related actually. To start off first, uh, 2.16 is about, again, about smart wave technology. This item was on the consent calendar last week. I don't quite know why it's here again. But, it, you know, if it's, if it's uh, indicative, indicative of anything, you know, good luck how to you know, work on this issue and always be considering uh, open public policies that go with this uh, digital inclusion tech. Um, there is parking tech issues, mobility tech issues uh, for the downtown area. Uh, also 2.12 and 2.14 that, you know, you just approved last week, you know, a whole bunch of funding, you know, including, you know, east side things and for downtown Wi-Fi projects. 
which indicates to myself that you know you're building up this mobile mobility future. Um, that's going to take a lot of geofencing issues, and that's a lot of data collection, and that's a lot of issues around you know open public policies that need to be talked about. It's not just privacy policies that protect people, it's open public policies that we know the rules of the road of what are good practices for all of us of a community, and we can all ask about. Good luck in how to make uh, these things open and transparent and accountable. And um, yeah, just to bring that up, uh, it's my job here basically. Um, one more item is uh, 7.1 about encampment issues. Um, it was a real tough meeting yesterday. Uh, good luck how we can talk about these things and, and try to give it a good positive idea to it. Um, I'm really into how we can possibly talk about small encampments in local neighborhoods, government sponsored encampments. Good luck to local neighborhood persons who can learn how to talk about these issues well and, and want to uh, have dialogue about it. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Hello, uh, Councilman, but thanks, see of San Jose. Uh, I'm the owner of the project 1212 and 1224 Winchester Boulevard, San Jose. We've been this project for since uh, June of 2019. We went through extensive meetings, extensive uh, uh, studies, and we're also dedicating one complete lane to the Winchester Boulevard, making it three lanes instead of two. And uh, the, all the study were done and completed about two months ago, two months plus. The staff report came out about uh, 10 days ago, which there's no difference, no surprises from what the, all the studies were. We have a, we are in the contract with a buyer who's doing 1031 exchange building a hotel. The exchange expires on November 1st, and they're very serious about my project. And this is a very, very tough market for hotels. This is cost about 45 to $50 million to build this project. I was advised that there are a number of uh, wonderful neighbors, which I respect dearly, that they're asking delays. The delay, it means it I would lose this uh, potential, not potential, this buyer. So I urge the city council that do not change our meeting on 26. Please hold on to the 26 meeting. Uh, all the studies were available. It's been two months. The staff report is just pretty much highlight what the studies were. No surprises, nothing was added. Again, we beg the city of San Jose, do not change the 26th because it would, put, it would kill my uh, contract uh, with this developer. I appreciate uh, your help on this. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Go ahead, Sarah. Take yourself off mute. So we're gonna keep Sarah in the queue, but we're gonna go to Jackie next. Hi, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, great. Hi, thank you. My name is Jackie Subek. I am a cannabis advocate, head of the California Cannabis Consumption Coalition, a resident of West Hollywood, and I'm also an owner of one of the West Hollywood licensed cannabis consumption lounges, as well as a regular cannabis smoker at home. I'm speaking today on uh, against item agenda 7.2 from October 26 regarding smoke free housing, specifically the portion that pertains to banning cannabis smoke inside households. Um, we went through this very same scenario in West Hollywood last year, and the ultimate result was that council voted to buy bifurcate cannabis from tobacco as it relates to smoking in the privacy of one's own home, and they removed it from the proposed ordinance. After reviewing each potential unintended consequence of an in-home ban on cannabis, ranging from existing landlords and tenants' rights to future housing developments, from seniors who are aging in place to HIPAA and other privacy concerns of our residents, and of course to government overreach, the West Hollywood City Council overwhelmingly voted to remove cannabis completely from the equation, amend the ordinance as it relates to tobacco, and then only on an as-needed basis add cannabis back in, specifically as it relates to banning all smoke from indoor common areas inside multi uh, 
unit family dwellings. Uh, you've heard about our expert legal opinion from Tamar Todd, one of the co-authors of Prop 64, who clearly outlined the original intent of that law was to prohibit cannabis smoking in public, not in private. Um, we, everybody has read that. The council has all read that. I strongly encourage all the staff members to review her letter as well before making any formal decisions. Um, this is definitely uh, going to lead to another disparity uh, and inequity for our uh, minorities, people of color, low-income communities who not, do not own their own home. And, and we have to remember that over 57% of voters in San Jose voted yes on Prop 64 in favor of cannabis legalization. The easiest way, in my opinion, is to drop the cannabis piece from this agenda and take the time to come up with a better plan that addresses the real issue, which is tobacco. And um, I really encourage the, this committee to vote completely to remove cannabis from this agenda item. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, let's give it another shot. Go ahead. Sarah, we're not, uh, this is not working. Sometimes I guess there's issues if you don't have the latest Zoom software. So um, see if you need a software update and then try again. Uh, we're gonna go to Tom. Go ahead, Tom. Hi, um, this is Gail Mormon, and um, thank you for um, letting me speak, Vice Mayor Jones and committee. Um, we'd like to make a formal request for a four-week delay in the city council hearing for the C19-031 and SP20-016, the conforming rezoning and special use permits for the property located at 1212 South Winchester Boulevard which is the Winchester Hotel proposal. On May 26, 1,109 pages of reports and documents were made public. Two of those reports were completed in 2019 and four were completed in 2020. We requested the reports but told they were under review. The community was then given a 21-day deadline to June 15th to submit formal comments. It took until four months later on October 15th, which was last week Friday, for the city responses to the public comments to be released and then that's which is 11 days before the scheduled city council hearing on October 26. We are requesting the four week delay in light of the impact this project would have on our community. The reason for the request is the complexity and volume of the documents now a total of 17, 1775 pages that are needed to be understood and reviewed. We feel this is a prudent request so that both the community and the city council have time to do their due diligence. We request this in light of the impact this project would have on our community, as well as on the Winchester Boulevard Urban Village. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Eddie? Hi, council members. Uh, Eddie Franco, Legislative and Regulatory Affairs Manager with the California Cannabis Industry Association. Uh, I also call regarding item 7.1 around the uh, smoke-free housing ordinance. I want to align my comments with Sarah, Sean, Jackie, and the others um, around this. Um, I'd specifically ask that this item be delayed or deferred otherwise um, to a future committee, such as the Economic Development Committee or another for reconsideration. Uh, in short, there are specific considerations that need to be made as it relates to cannabis uh, before making such a carte blanche uh, uh, de facto ban on smoking overall. Um, there are equity issues, there are logistic issues, there are issues around scientific research as, as brought up previously. Um, as such, we, we recommend that, that um, this item be reconsidered and when reconsidered, cannabis be carved out or otherwise um, left out of such an ordinance. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, person with the number ending in... Three one five seven. Uh, I spoke earlier, yes, Sarah. Thank that, you for your time. No worries. All right. Um, bring it back to the committee, and um, whoever makes the motion 
uh, note that there's an ad sheet in first uh, first person is Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. So my uh, concern actually is with item 7.2, and I know that we had gotten some um, strong lobbying at the when this was coming to council and uh, that 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 made us all pause especially some of the advocacy coming from the law foundation and wanting to make sure that we didn't impose restrictions that actually um, made things worse on on people specifically those of lower income uh, lesser means um, and one of the things that I think stood out to me as well was just the the equity argument, which I would say we, we haven't gotten there yet, where I know we're almost there on uh, requiring uh, a section in our memos to actually look at things uh, like an equity impact, similar to how we do with Climate Smart uh, at the end of our memos. This memo actually did that uh, within the memo, uh, and so I do appreciate that. And um, in looking at that and, and in understanding the concerns from uh, community members that have spoken up, I think there is a, a real concern there. Um, and specifically, I think when you're talking about uh, cannabis users and knowing that cannabis is not something right now that uh, people can, can simply go outside and, and be able to utilize, they're expected to utilize uh, that in the privacy of their own home for lower income individuals that are living in multifamily housing uh, that now eliminates this, this opportunity, or we could be eliminating that opportunity and, and not really giving them um, any others. So I, I do think there's, there's real concern there. Um, I, I would have wanted to see maybe some more analysis on that and why we're not recommending that cannabis be excluded. What I'm seeing here is that it talks about, um, it's talking about uh, other cities that have recently adopted in Santa Clara County that sort of just did an all-inclusive, but I, I don't really see any other justification as to why. Uh, and I know there were a couple cities that actually, uh, as we heard today, uh, like West Hollywood, that actually did exclude it. So there, there may be some argument one way or the other. I'm curious if staff, uh, anybody's here that could let us know what what transpired in the last month or so since we deferred this item at council? Um, did we actually have any other further conversations um, before bringing this back? Thank you, council member. And Tony, can I ask you to bring over Chris Burton from the attendee side into as a panelist? Yes, I've clicked promote to panelist. He just has to accept. He looks like he's on his way in. Hopefully, even with that question, he will accept and come in. There he is. Thanks, Council Member. Yeah, it, obviously, there's been a number of different conversations, and we've been working closely with many of the advocacy groups around this issue. I think um, uh, we've been looking at other cities and how they'd approach this work, um, and, and certainly San Francisco. and. There'd been some questions around how they'd uh, thought about and presented their work related to uh, the exclusion of cannabis from the ordinance. Um, I think, you know, um, we'd not been looking at West Hollywood as closely. Um, and so San Francisco, in, in their approach, actually, uh, they excluded cannabis through their first hearing of the ordinance, but then it got held up in process and they never actually moved forward with their approval. Um, but West Hollywood did exclude it. And obviously, there's been additional information that we've received around this issue that we're now uh, ultimately just uh, taking a look at to, to uh, understand the implications of that. I think um, certainly our intent would be to bring forward a supplemental ahead of Tuesday's discussion if it occurs there with additional information on that. Uh, otherwise, we can report back um, as committee or council sees fit. Okay. And so what has transpired since the last council meeting when we, when we deferred this? Uh, I think I don't remember exactly the direction, but I think we, we wanted to be able to allow time for further discussion on it because of these concerns. So what, what has happened in, in that time? Yeah, so there's been additional outreach with both uh, the advocacy groups and with property owners around this um, and certainly getting additional technical information from uh, the, the consultant with the county who's been supporting us on this work to do some of that analysis. I think the, the sort of more recent addition to that is the information regarding West Hollywood, which we won't uh, 
we weren't aware of until sort of uh, last couple of days, really. Okay. All right. I, I think, um, especially, it sounds like you are thinking of a supplemental memo, which we don't have right now. So it's, in essence, I'm looking at kind of what I looked at before previously, right? I'm not necessarily getting any new info. And I'm concerned uh, with that. And I would prefer that we actually see something like that supplemental first, before we agendize it uh, for the council discussion. I, I was considering, you know, does, is this is this a significant enough of a conversation that it should go back to the committee first? I, I don't know if that's the case. I know that some of our advocates are, are wanting that to be the case. Um, I think this is a pretty significant, you know, section of it that I'm concerned with. But I, I, I'm, you know, without seeing your supplemental, I don't know if, uh, you know, if that's the case that it that it would need to go all the way back to committee, or if maybe we just have a, a change of 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 heart in the recommendation and we end up um, suggesting something different, and and maybe that would be um, sufficient for me. But I don't know about my colleagues either. Uh, I I do think that, you know, this is a good policy, but I think there are a few things that we're running into here at the end where I think we just want to be conscious of it before we make a final decision, and rather than have a long drawn out sort of debate without really having time to understand some of the the, the options um, I would be concerned with keeping this on the agenda for um, for next week so my request wouldn't necessarily be that it has to go back to committee uh, although I wouldn't be uh, you know against that if, if staff felt that was beneficial or if my colleagues felt maybe that was beneficial I, you know, I'm, I'm up in the air on that. I think at least it should not be on the agenda next week. I'd like to see that supplemental first, and then maybe we can re-agendize it um, for uh, a future meeting or even um, sending it back to committee. But at least I'd like to uh, take this off of the agenda for next week for now. And so I'll, I'll make a motion uh, if we could uh, uh, to approve the agenda for next week, including the ad sheet but um, dropping item 7.2. Second. All right, moved and seconded. Uh, are you done, council member? Great. Yes. Council thank member you. Cohen. Yes, thank you. And I can't figure out why my camera's not working, but I'll only be here on audio. Um, so just, just some little background also for council member Paulus. I mean, we, it was, my, it was my, my request to defer the item originally. Um, because our office felt that we needed to do more research since we were trying to put together a memo on some things here. And, and there was a, there was a lot of issues beyond the cannabis issue that we wanted to have addressed. Our office has spent a lot of time doing a lot of that research and feels better that we understand some of those things and we're ready to write a memo on that this week. Um, I think that we, we have, we're working, we've been working together with some others on the cannabis issue. And I think through a memo, whether a supplemental memo that Chris just mentioned, or a memo that, that we were going to work on in our office, we could we could resolve that issue through a memo by next week. Having said that, there's also um, concerns that are being raised by some people about the question of eviction, potential evictions for people in lower income rental facilities that are a little bit tougher to resolve um, about how you um, avoid, you know, first of all, we want to avoid um, uh, leading to criminal, any kind of criminal action or misdemeanor action, and also want to make sure that we're not going to make our eviction situation worse. So I actually do want to recommend bringing it to committee to discuss that issue. Um, I'm not sure we need to bring it back for the cannabis issue to ESD, but that NSE might, might benefit from having a conversation about how we resolve some of the other questions before it comes back to council. So I would just ask that we amend your motion to refer, maybe we can even open this point to the appropriate committees as needed, um, at least NSC, if not NSC and, and, and the other and the ESD. Um, so those are my, uh, I'd like to just ask for that from the amendment to, to your motion. Yeah, um, I would be more comfortable then if it stayed together as a package and if it goes back to NSC first to further discuss, um, you know, that item of eviction that you're concerned about, I, I would agree that's a valid concern, but also for me, the, the issue of, of uh, cannabis, and I, I would say I um, appreciate you're working on something, but, uh, you know, I would prefer that it all go back 
to to stay together then and um, I'm happy to to ask that not only get dropped but that it get referred back to NSC before it comes back to uh, the full council. Okay, that's good. Thanks. And would it just be NSC or NSC and CED? You know, I think the NSC part is important. I, I think we can start with NSC. I, I don't know if it needs to go to CED. Okay. All right. Uh, are you done, Council Member? Yes. All right. Um, I also want to make a uh, friendly amendment to defer item 10.2, which is the Winchester Hotel, um, to um, the council meeting for November 16th. Um, I've had numerous meetings with the residents there, and they're very engaged in the process. Um, they spend a lot of time going through all the documentation, making comments. Uh, pouring through every, um, again, document and information that you can think of. And um, if they're coming to me and saying they need additional time to really do their due diligence, then I, I accept that as, as valid and a valid justification. Uh, the developer uh, made statements that, you know, he has a, a deadline or a firm timeline in terms of getting something done or his opportunities are gonna go away. Uh, this is brand new information to me. Uh, we've made you know, numerous attempts to have a clear line of communication with this individual and, and we haven't had much success. So it's not surprising that I would get that information you know, at, in this meeting and he didn't inform us of that before. So I, I'm not going to, um, validate his concerns and I want to make a friendly amendment to defer this to the council meeting on November 16th. Second. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with including that in the motion. I appreciate it. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Tony? Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Jones? Aye. All right. On to the agenda for November 2nd. And we're going to start out on pages four and five. Six and seven. Eight and nine. Ten. And let's go to the public. And the first speaker is Tessa. Go ahead, Tessa. Thank you, Vice Mayor and City Council members, honor, honorable City Council members and Vice Mayor for this opportunity. Um, so uh, I um, was talking about that the development at the corner of uh, Santa Clara and uh, Almaden Boulevard. And I've always looked at that because of the gorgeous mural of the cornucopia and the female that's there and um, just beautiful and, and, and the issue of the fact that it was an, open, an empty lot. And my husband is a biologist and climate scientist looking at saying uh, to build resiliency into our community, we needed to, um, any open land should become uh, food production. And, I, and that was the beauty of that land. It should become that. And yet we're planning a hotel, another hotel. And, you know, and it's, it's the same issues that the whole community is up in arms about. And I appreciate the other issue with the one on Winchester, because that's not the way we should be going when we have so many crises that we're, we're experiencing and um, the housing crisis, our, our climate crisis. And, and I, the irony is that the state of California is giving us money to um, turn our, our hotels into housing. And yet we're going ahead and, and you know, what is, you know, the expression is, you know, when you're doing something wrong, you don't keep doing it. And if you know, you're in a hole, you don't keep digging. 
And it's the same thing. We don't need hotels. We need housing. And so this is, this is where we need to move forward. And, and that's what the climate scientists are saying. We need to have a you know, decarbonization of our economy, of our transportation, of our industry, and of our agriculture. And that's where we have to build. You know, we shouldn't be supporting uh, hotels. We need to be staying home. We have the beautiful technology of the internet that we can connect and we can keep you know, our so-called economy going with, with our technology. We've proved it to ourselves. And yet we you know, keep going into you know, digging into deeper into the hole, which is our, our fossil fuel use, which has to stop. Thank you. Blair? Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, for item 3.3, COVID pandemic response and community economic recovery budget adjustment ideas, um, kind of along the lines of what Tessa was saying and, and that, you know, in, in next week's agenda also, uh, you have item 3.3 about capital improvement project ideas. Um, this, this item uh, about COVID uh, responses and budget adjustments, uh, you know, good luck. It talks about uh, the American Rescue Plan funds, emergency reserve funding. Um, I, I hope, uh, you know, it's been a, an important point of myself to just simply bring out the concept that uh, I hope we can talk about uh, these state and federal funding patterns that are very large and have become more easy and, and accessible for local governments in this era of COVID. And uh, to learn how to talk about these funding programs and these subsidy programs with community and for community themselves to be, uh, to grow more comfortable with this subject matter, uh, it's important. And, you know, it's, it's important to, there's an openness to this sort of conversation and we learn to not go afraid of it. And, uh, and it's from there that I think we can make uh, responsible decisions, decisions needed for specific projects and, and how, like with housing issues, you know, there's a lot of things we already do well. How can subsidies help, you know, these sort of things? And uh, so good luck how we can do that at this time and just have, you know, open good conversations with all parts of ourselves as a community. And it can be easier for government to explain these things to our public and our public can be more understanding how to offer conversation about this subject matter. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Bringing it back to the committee. Can I get a motion, please? I'll move to approve the agenda. Thank you. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Tony? Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Jones? Aye. Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor, very quickly, um, and I'm going to ask Glory to jump in if I mess this up, um, but if, if I could ask the Rules Committee to reconsider the vote on October 28th, um, if you would still like, but with the deferral of 10.2, um, we still have an evening meeting with one land use consent item that if you could read that notice for 1.30 to happen with consent because it is a consent item, you'd be able to cancel the night meeting. Sounds like a plan. Um, so would I need a motion to reconsider or what, what would I? I'll, I'll make a motion to reconsider uh, the vote. I'll second. Okay, it's moved and seconded. Okay, Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Jones? Aye. Thank you. So, so and just to confirm, Lee, you, you meant the 26th, right? Not the yes, 20. I'm sorry, the 26th with 10.2 uh, now deferred. We still have 10.1, which is a consent land use item that you could uh, re-notice for 130 um, or has already been re-noticed for 130 and thus cancel your night meeting. Okay, I'll, I'll remake that, that motion and to approve the calendar for uh, 1026, including the ad sheet, but then dropping um, 7.2. Um, and uh, and uh, redirecting that to NSE committee, and then also dropping ten point uh, or uh, ten point one, uh, or was that a deferral, Vice Mayor? For ten point two, 
Yes. Is it a deferral to November 16th? Okay, sorry, a deferral 10.2 uh, to November 16th, and then uh, moving 10.1 uh, to be uh, heard at 1.30. Second. All right, Tony? Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Davis? Yes. Carlos? Yes. Jones? Aye. Thank you. Okay, good catch, Lee. Thank you. That was Gloria. Good okay, good catch, Gloria. Thank you. All right, uh, on to meeting schedules. Uh, gender-based violence and child sexual assault joint meeting. And I'm gonna go to the public first and the first speaker is Tessa. Thank you. Oh, okay, good. Um, so I I'm not exactly sure and you don't have it posted exactly what it is, like to help us with our communication to the council. But um, what you said is just child sexual abuse. And um, what we really need is to have um, another system going that um, pr provides resources for mothers to stay home. And, you know, that, that, that's the kind of transformational changes we needed, we need, and that the, the, the social, the scientists, the psychologists are saying that children need one person that they can have all the time, unstressed, uh, an unstressed caregiver, and, um, and ideally it's the mother, because that's where it starts. That's how everything starts, where you know, the children are born out of the mother. And so the, you know, to have that continuum of care that is so critical to the well-being of our, of our children and to really support that. And, um, you know, I mean, we talk about, you know, that the first five years are critical, but it's really the whole life cycle that's, you know, for sure the first 18, for sure. And so, you know, I'm saying is that we need to reconsider how we're, um, you know, saying, oh, it's so great. We got to get women back into the workforce. The, the real, the most important job is raising our children. And that, you know, it's, it's that um, outsourcing of the care that, you know, provides the potential for abuse. And so we need that, you know, connect, connection to um, our children and to support that as a society uh, going forward. And so, and then that's where so much of our fossil fuel use and our waste has come is when you look at the, the chart our, is that 1970s when women went to work, that's when the fossil fuel went up. That's when the waste went up, the, the plastic went up. It's all the externalities of going to work. And we need to, you know, correct that by. Uh, Blair. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Um, thank you for this item. Uh, it's my understanding, you know, this, this is work of a, you know, this is a whole county effort. And, um, you know, thank you to this, to these good efforts. I know that, uh, you know, the work of Councilperson Perales at this time is trying to bring around ideas of uh, uh, workplace issues and, and, how, and what can be good counseling services for, for workplace issues. How this can possibly tie into this work, uh, good luck. Um, it's important stuff. Um, I've always uh, made it a point that, you know, with, with, with this efforts, um, there, the degree that the police are involved, it may be minimal compared to, you know, health and human services needs and, and other community needs. But uh, I, as police are kind of in some early stages of this program, um, I, I've always been trying to mention the importance of the peer review program for policing and how they can talk about these sort of event, events between themselves afterwards and, and get some sort of bearing about the situation. I under, I'm understanding you may not quite have a good counseling vetting process in place for such a peer review program for police in this issue. But I think it can do amazing good things if you can. And we should be working on some things at this time, and especially at the county level, that uh, you know, for all the good uh, counseling services and human uh, needs services, working with hospitals and the like that uh, this can offer, you know, to develop a, a good uh, peer review program should still be important to yourselves. And it's really important for our future community. 
good luck with this uh, part of this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Bringing it back to the committee, Council Member Arenas. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to um, provide a little bit of perspective on, on this um, joint meeting. This is, uh, I, I believe it's our fourth joint meeting around gender-based violence. And this time around, we are um, specifically talking about a couple of issues. One is our safe exams, um, our sexual assault forensic exams and those protocols. And the second item is also talking about um, what we might or what our society might experience as children are going back to in-person learning. And now that they have um, a trusting adult in their lives, they might uh, reveal that they have suffered child abuse uh, during the pandemic. And so how do we prioritize and how do we, how do, what is the strategy to ensure that those kinds of um, reports uh, don't go to the bottom of the queue when we have uh, other things and the thinly, you know, staffed uh, police um, force. Um, and so this, these are the conversations that we need to just proactively have. And, um, and I invite everybody to please attend. Um, this is led um, uh, by Supervisor Cindy Chavez and myself. Um, but the lead on, on, um, on this committee is, of course, Councilmember Perales. Um, and so I just want to thank him as well for allowing us to to veer off a little bit uh, uh, um, from the straight path that normally our committees take in um, just meeting uh, independently of everybody else. And so I just wanted to take a moment to thank him and um, and just uh, just to share with our public uh, because there's some there were some comments about this um, uh, just to clarify what we were going to be talking about. Um, and, and, and by the way, the majority of child abuse that is reported is um, committed by somebody um, familiar to that child, either a family member or a friend. Um, so we always have to be very vigilant um, with our children. Council member, do you want to make the motion? I forgot about that. Yes. <laughs> Motion to approve. All right. Can I get a second? Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, Tony? Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Jones? Yes. Thank you. Okay. On to the public record. Uh, I'm going to go to the public first. And go ahead, Blair. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Uh, I have a letter. It was my first attempt to write about the uh, the uh, the vaccine process and how we can talk about it uh, this fall. Um, I I think my words have matured a bit since I first wrote this letter, and uh, I just want to thank yourselves for your patience and in, in what I'm I'm trying to work on something very in decent terms, and I don't want to upset things. I just want to hopefully offer a way that we can create a dialogue if it can be helpful. You know, not everything about it will be helpful, but I'm hoping some of it can be. And uh, I guess that's the key to, to what how I'm writing on this subject at this time. And uh, some of my words got cut off yesterday at, at uh, I think, 3.4 in talking about this item. Uh, I spoke about Southwest pilots and uh, you know, they weren't, they, they had possibly a walkout a few weeks ago, you know, about the vaccine mandate, not to protest the vaccine mandate, but just in how to talk about it uh, with, with the negotiation process they're in. And that's all I'm trying to consider is how can we talk about this subject? How can it be open subject matter? And for yourselves to be able to work on that and come back to the community with new ideas this fall, uh, interesting ways to talk about it, uh, that's hopeful. And of course, I, I do bring up the ideas of how the uh, surveillance and technology ordinance ideas can really help uh, facilitate uh, ways to have good conversation. Um, uh, with my remaining time, um, 
you know, there's uh, letters about the Vista Montana things. I really hope uh, these these two, this is all all the sides can work these things out and uh, uh, be negotiative. And the ideas of a of a notification process can really set a course uh, for the rest of the city for the rest of our days how we can talk about these sort of things in the future. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you, Honorable Vice. Um, and, uh, you know, I just wanted to comment um, about the process for the public to understand that we do have a chance to c communicate when we send letters. And I haven't really checked. I, I sent a letter um, to, I think when you send it to the city clerk is when it gets put into this record. So I have been sending my letters. And the letter that I sent, and I'll, I'll quickly talk about the other ones that I know Blair mentioned, just in case mine isn't in the record, but it should have been because I was talking about the subcommittees and that the subcommittees need to be open. And um, basically, you know, that we're not getting as open government as you propose that we are. And the subcommittees are a critical part of our de democratic process and, and the public should be at least given the record of it, you know, so we can view it on the YouTube or, uh, or then um, even, you know, uh, visual, you know, be participating in those meetings. But one or the other that the, the site into those subcommittees is critical as we go forward because we're addressing so many critical crisis issues. We need to know um, just the public understand, you know, who has been responsible for, you know, when, when the, the issue, the scientists are saying we have four years to save humanity. We need to know who's involved with that. And then the issue is, or not involved is the issue. So going forward for the future, but um, th that there's a record for the future generations is what I'm saying. And so anyway, um, the other issue that Blair is bringing up about the vaccine, I, you know, I've always been saying is that the vaccine, you know, is just a bandaid on a, on a bigger problem. And the thing is we need to really vaccinate ourselves from capitalism and consumerism. And that really is work staying at home, you know, having our, our meetings uh, virtually when we can, working at home when we can, schooling at home when we can. And to say that, you know, it doesn't work is not true. And we're, there's a lot of gaps. Thank you. Bringing it back to the committee. Um, Councilmember Reyes, I see your hand is still up. I'm assuming that was from the previous item. Um, yes, Chair. Can I get a motion in a second, please? Motion to approve. Second. second. All right, Tony. Arenas. Yes. Cohen. Aye. Davis. Yes. Corrales. Yes. Jones. Aye. Thank you. Okay, on to the consent calendar, and I'm going to go to the public and. First speaker is Tessa. Well, okay. I guess I'm not too up on this whole thing with the consent calendar uh, of the, I guess it's maybe of the um, the November 4th or so um, um, city council meeting. I'm not sure. Is that what the consent calendar that we're looking at is the November? Is that what you're looking at? No, huh? it's the, the items that are listed under consent, uh, okay. there's various items. For the, for, for the future agenda item, for our future agenda? No, these are no. for oh, okay. events and okay. Oh, events. bag raisings okay. and sponsor, other sponsors. Oh, okay, good. Oh, okay, good. So, okay, thank you for that. I really appreciate that, um, Vice Mayor, Honorable Vice Mayor. Thank you. And so getting back to the, the point, do I, did I lose my time? Did I lose it? No? Are you hear me? So, I uh, hear you. Okay, good. Thank you, sweetie. Yeah, I'm just saying all of our events need to be fossil fuel free. That's something we need to really promote in our resiliency programs and that we don't drive to work. We don't drive to events. We don't, that, that's what we have to have. And that's why we need to really be realigning measure B to create bikeable and walkable communities. That needs to be our highest priority because that's where people don't want to bicycle because they don't feel safe. And we're, we need to put all of our resources into that. And that's where I've been complaining about why I can't fix a bike lane that's very dangerous, that we don't have a bike lane. That's what I'm saying. We don't have it. And yet we're, and we're not putting our resources where our mouth is. We're not really doing Vision Zero. And the way we get Vision Zero is more of us are off the road. And all of us are off the road. Actually, the way we get Vision Zero is to become a bike, uh, a car-free city. We really need to become 
a car free downtown at least and google village needs to be car free that's how the urban you know that's why santana row is doing so well that's why our european nations are doing better because they have created in the urban core a, a, a car free zones and and definitely when they're looking at you know why san jose downtown isn't doing as well as santana row it's because they have created that that european village with car free i don't even know i haven't been up there Tessa? but yes we, am i done uh well you're you strayed away from on, oh okay i love you i know you're so good and thank you for helping me stay on task for the flag raising and this whatever we're doing and you know and we have so many events that we are encouraging people to come downtown but it needs to be car free Thank you. Uh, bringing it back to the committee. Can I get a motion, please? Move approval. Move approval. Second. And I, also, I'm sorry, I Miss Blair. So before we vote, uh, go ahead, Blair. Ooh, thank you. Thank you that you saw me. Thank you very much. No worries. Uh, yeah, I wanted to quickly comment on the uh, Filipino uh, flag raising uh, or, or Filipino uh, History Month and flag raising ceremony. Um, a quick few thoughts uh, from Tessa's words. Uh, thank you, and that uh, we do need to be uh, really considering the subcommission subcommittee process because there's going to be three important uh, San Jose commissions coming up in the next six months. Uh, a good subcommittee process that's open to the public uh, is is helpful. Sorry, thank you. Uh, to speak to the uh, Filipino American History Month uh, flag raising ceremony, I just wanted to, uh, I know uh, this is a memo from Councilperson Carrasco actually. I know that Councilperson Arenas uh, used to work on these issues uh, more with the Filipino community and, and just to thank you that, um, you know, for, for their work and efforts, because um, I, we're really trying to address a, a real long time problem of, of, of the, um, the island of the Philippines in their issues of how they go about their, their legal matters with, with, with criminality issues and, what, and how they define what is criminality and their, I don't know, justice <laughs> that they impose. It's really strong and it's not, it doesn't use the, the court system very well sometimes. And uh, we're trying to note this in this country and really help out to bring them around to a more justice oriented uh, way in deciding their issues. So th to have this uh, awareness uh, and things this month, uh, good luck how we can work on these issues. Thank you. Thank you. We already have a motion and a second. So Tony. Arenas. Yes. Owen. Aye. Davis. Yes. Carlos. Yes. Jones. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Next item is the um, retroactive purchase of raffle prizes and. So we'll go to the public first, and I don't see any hands raised on that item. Oh, spoke too soon. Go ahead, Tessa. And this is uh, good. related yeah. to the retroactive, um, the retroactive purchase of raffle prizes. So if you can. Okay, <laughs> if I can connect to that. And I, yes. I did want to say that I truly appreciate you as an honorable vice mayor because you're so good at handling these meetings and the public. So thank you for that. You truly are honorable. Um, okay, sweetie. Uh, let's see. So yeah, the retroactive <laughs> um, raffle tickets. Okay, yes. Well, I'm sure it, it's very consumption oriented and, and all the plastic and junk and raffle items and, and consumer goods and you know you know that we pay for as our taxpayers you know tax we need to um you know be, you know stop you know stop consuming stop buying and stop uh you know that 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 really needs to be our 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 education as we go forward and so having raffle items of what are those raffle items and where where what is the supply chain and where where did they come from and you know everything to look at you know what are we giving people what what do people need really as their raffle items and and what is it that we need you know we need our basic needs met and we're not we're not addressing that we're not looking at you know how to save the people and and what what is it that's going to help us to go forward as a species and it's not some little trinket of of 
of, of something that you might be giving as a raffle. So, you know, what is it that we really need? We need to most probably be giving food. You know, we should be, that's how it should be. It should be vegetables and fruits and, and those type of things that, you know, uh, we give as we support and how, uh, you know, we, and, and or, or, you know, what I, I think would be great is seeds, you know, to give somebody seeds so they can grow food. That, that would be the kind of gifts we should give them. Uh, or, you know, maybe a class for them to learn how to grow food, you know? And so the, these are the kind of raffles we should be um, orienting ourselves in towards our survival versus our, 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 de our you know, decline as we go forward, as the science is saying, if we don't have transformational change, we, you know, we will be uh, going extinct. Thank you. Uh, that's the end of the public comments. So bring it back to the committee. Move approval. Right. Second. All right. Uh, Tony? Arenas? Yes. Owen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Jones? Yes. Thank you. Okay, next item is federal immigration reform. And we also have an early consideration response form. Uh, we're going to go to the public first, and then I'm going to go to Lee and then the committee. So the first public speaker is Jose. Go ahead, Jose. Good afternoon, uh, Honorable San Jose uh, Council members and uh, the Vice Mayor. Uh, my name is Jose Luis Pavon. I am a political organizer with SEIU USWW. Uh, we wanna thank you um, and, and thank uh, Council Member uh, Maya Sparsa, especially for um, putting forward this resolution. Um, immediately, the US Congress is debating uh, the Build Back Better Infrastructure Bill and included in that bill um, through, the, through the budget process, there is a proposal to create a pathway for citizenship for 11 million undocumented immigrants nationwide. Um, we are humbly asking, asking the San Jose City Council to please uh, pass a resolution, and that's what uh, Mrs. Sparsa is going to be speaking on, um, so that to, to ask the U.S. Congress to please um, make immigration reform a priority within the context of the Build Back Better bill um, that is being pushed by uh, President Biden's administration. And... Uh, you know, San Jose is, is, has a huge immigrant community. Immigrants make up a pillar of the San Jose economy, uh, domestic workers, janitors, construction workers um, across the board are major industries that depend on, on immigrant labor, many of them undocumented immigrants. In addition, immigrants make up a large percentage of the consumers in San Jose, as well as taxpayers. Even if they're an undocumented and do not pay directly to the IRS, they pay sales taxes, they, they pay rent, and the property owners that rent to them pay into uh, the tax base of the city of San Jose. So we urge you, please, to um, support uh, uh, Ms. Meyer Sparsa's uh, resolution and um, support immigration reform. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Blair? Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. I really like the, the memo. Uh, uh, written for this item. Um, yeah, it, it, I think it, it tried to speak of the issues of, of undocumented, undocumented immigrants and not just uh, path to citizenship issues. Uh, path to citizenship issues are items that uh, Obama was working on way back in like, I don't know, 2012, 2013, and 14. Uh, and I, I suppose 2014 was when he really got into it and was really hoping, and it's like, this is its return. And I'm, I'm really for these things. Um, I'm also hopeful in the concepts of how do we talk about the border itself and the future of the process of how people go back and forth across the border and how can that be in a more accessible open border? And um, I hope that can somehow make its way to this dialogue in, in, in our needs of path to citizenship ideas that are really important and I think easy to understand and incredibly helpful. And it's from that, 
I don't know what the order is. Do we then start to consider, you know, actual border policy and how and how that whole process can loosen up? And then from there, how people, if they do come to this country for jobs, are not exploited. And uh, those are all important concepts I'd like to work on. And uh, yeah, this is really hopeful stuff. And I'm very um, thank you for for it being here. And this is, uh, it's nice to see our, our future again and what our lives are again. And so thank you for this. Thank you, uh, Tessa. Yes, thank you for this um, item. Yes, it's a very big concern as we were looking in our Southern border and we had issues of people coming from Honduras and Guatemala and that they had been so impacted from the um, hurricanes that came, there were two of them that came and hit, I think in 2020, just last year. And so, you know, they were coming and, and you know, we were, you know, that they, they had an unlivable area that their crops were not growing. And I mean, it was all destroyed from the hurricanes and, and the droughts or, or the other climate uh, impacts that are affecting their, their area. And so when they come to our border, um, we believe, uh, you know, in talking with my husband is he says that we should bring all those people in and actually have them help us to grow food here because that's what we need to start doing. And they know how to do that. And we need to do that. And then on top of it, we need to go back into uh, Honduras and Guatemala and help them to um, create a, um, a fossil fuel free infrastructure so that they could be part of the solution. And maybe, if just maybe, we could bring their, 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 those lands back to be habitable. Because that's what's happening is that it's becoming, um, you know, more uninhabitable earth. And that's where we are ha the crises that are coming to, to San Jose are, they're saying a billion people will be, un uh, um, will be de destabilized in by 2050, a billion, that that's how quickly we're becoming an uninhabitable earth. And so how do we deal with that in terms of our immigration? We need to, to yes, to take the people in as, as climate refugees and, and learn to that we do need to take our asphalt up and turn us back into the Valley of Heart's Delight just here in San Jose, that we need the help, the, the, the workforce to start building a, a green agricultural economy, a decarbonizing our economy, and to you know, grow food locally. And so, and then to help them with their country. Uh, Gary? Go ahead, Gary. Gary, you can go ahead and uh, talk now. Well, let's um, skip over Gary and go to um, Araceli. Hello, my name is Araceli. I am with SEIU USWW. I am a political organizer and um, I do want to thank Council Member Baez Barsa for proposing this, um, this immigration resolution. As we know, the nation is home to 11 million undocumented folks. Many of them do reside in San Jose, California. And we, throughout the pandemic, we depended on, depended on them to keep the economy going. Many of them are farm workers that kept food on the table because they didn't have the privilege to stay at, to stay at home and work from home. Many of them are janitors that were still cleaning the Facebook buildings, Google buildings. And also many of them were construction workers that continue to build all these new developments that are that are being built in San Jose, California. And like I said, many of these essential workers weren't privileged enough to work from home, to get stimulus money, to collect unemployment because of their status. And I think it is owed to them that Congress passes an, an immigration reform because they contribute to, to the economy. You know, they maintain our populations, the institutions, and we have to make sure that that we give them what is owed to them. Thank you. Thank you. That is um, it for public comments. So um, I know Council Member Asparza is has joined us as, as a panelist. So uh, Council Member, go ahead and uh, 
speak to your memo. Thank you, Vice Mayor, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to bring this today for it to come to council. Um, we mentioned in the memo that this, what we're doing as a country is we have a once in a generation opportunity to act, to create a pathway for a pathway to citizenship for 11 million undocumented immigrants in our country, including the 25,000 here in San Jose. Here's another statistic. One in six of California's children have at least one undocumented parent. So we need a pathway to citizenship for folks who are our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends. And uh, as was mentioned in the comments during COVID, we know so many of them put themselves and their families in harm's way so that they could provide for their families and for all of us during this pandemic. Uh, so many of them have worked tirelessly during the pandemic, but actually the entire time they're here, um, they keep our society going and we owe them the opportunity to, to have a pathway to citizenship. While we're talking about COVID, I wanted to remind folks um, that when you look at that map that we've looked at the city council so many times, um, you know, it's, it's no coincidence that the essential workers, the high immigrant population that we have as a city, um, that the same five east side zip codes have faced the worst of the public health crisis. 95122, 95116, 95127, 95121, and 95111 um, are also five of the largest zip codes, um, uh, sorry, five of our zip codes with the largest immigrant communities. So right now, I know we're San Jose, but we're the 10th largest city in the country. This is our opportunity to speak up and speak out in support of our undocumented neighbors um, to push Congress and the president to approve comprehensive immigration reform through this current federal budget process. So this comes at a time um, when a recent federal ruling in Texas um, on DACA has thrown the future of the program in doubt. And so we do need action now. And I believe it's consistent with our role as the 10th largest city in the country uh, to speak up. That's it for me. Thank you, council member. Uh, Lee, I know there was a early consideration response form that was submitted. There is vice mayor and that's green. This is consistent with past policies that the mayor and council have directed us and actions that the Office of Racial Equity and Intergovernmental Relations Program have taken over the last several years and appreciate the memorandum from council member Sparza. Great. I'll move to Lee. Sorry, I'll let the others comment. I was just gonna make the motion to approve, but I see other hands up. I'll second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Um, council member Arenas. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, well, I, I wanted to take uh, the opportunity to thank council member Esparza um, for bringing this into the forefront. Um, there's a lot that we need to have a conversation as a country and as a city, um, especially on our path to recovery. Um, and this is definitely not one of the top three issues that people bring up, they bring up um, economic recovery, even social emotional is on the table now. It's, it's part of what how we need to recover. But this, this immigration um, piece is key um, in showing future administrations how to um, fold in the folks who are making America run. And, and so I just wanted to say thank you. And I, um, I was also hoping to make that motion, but um, thank you, Council Member Cohen, you, 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 got, you got to it. Um, so anyways, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Esparza. Thank you, uh, Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you as well uh, to Council Member uh, Esparza for bringing this forward. Uh, I think this really is a tremendous opportunity that we we have, uh, and we want to be able to to send our encouragement to Congress um, to be able to act. My uh, or I, I was a, a child of of, of one of those uh, undocumented immigrants many many years back, um, and 
Um, my father went through the process of ultimately being a legal permanent resident and then ultimately becoming a citizen. And uh, as Maya points out, so many of our children here in California and here in, in San Jose uh, live in that experience with a true fear of not knowing if uh, someday their parent is going to be deported. And um, it, it is a true life in the shadows. And uh, these are people that are working very, very hard day in and day out to keep our uh, economy going, our community moving and safe. Uh, people that, as Councilmember Esparza pointed out, uh, we're going to work day in and day out through this pandemic while uh, a majority of us were, were able to work safe from home. Uh, these were the individuals that overwhelmingly uh, could not do that. Um, and um, I think this has been a long time coming and um, we, we don't want to miss this opportunity. So I absolutely support this, support sending the strong message of support um, from the city of San Jose, 10th largest city in the country over to Congress. So thanks, Councilmember Esparza. Thank you. And also thank you, Councilmember Esparza too. Uh, I do have a question, uh, Lee, and you touched on this when you were speaking to this. Um, sometimes we'll have resolutions come before this committee that we deem uh, not within the, the city's sphere of influence or is not one of our um, principles or various other reasons why we choose to not move forward. Uh, can you just reiterate the distinction between this resolution and some of the others that we did not move forward? Just so people are really clear on, you know, our consistency in following, you know, protocols and practices. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I would say, I think we've handled this on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you know, for me, um, at least when I used to oversee the IGR program, you know, when it affected our residents uh, very directly, like, like something like this would, um, that's very easy for us to say that, yes, we should step into the arena. And on something like this, where it is not just fundamentally that Congress needs to hear from large cities or, or other large cities, um, but that our voice matters on a subject, we felt very comfortable stepping in um, and, and not just lending our, our, uh, our name and our voice in that, but being quite loud um, on some of these matters. But for us, we really try and draw the line when it directly impacts the residents of San Jose. And this absolutely would. Great, thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Um, Tony? Um, do we know when this needs to come back? Do we have a date, a referral date? Good question. Or just, uh, it just usually we, we've got like some sort of referral date so we know when to bring it back when we make the motion. It would, uh, yeah, I, I, I think I'd long to put together a, a resolution so it, a week? And I believe we have a resolution. Um, I guess we did not discuss that um, internally, but I would think we could agendize this for two or three weeks away, um, given that the resolution is out there. Um, and if the bill moves more swiftly than that, this is already encompassed, encompassed in our legislative guiding principles uh, that the council has approved. So the IGR team, as well as Office of Racial Equity team have the ability to take action if Congress moves more swiftly. So two weeks. Does it work? Okay. So, so no should, all right. Um, Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Jones Perales? Yes. Jones. Aye. Thank you. Okay, on to taxi issues. So I'm gonna go to the public first. And the first public speaker is Tessa. Oh, thank you. Um, well, you know, I was interested to see how the process goes and that um, things bring are brought to the rules committee directly. They don't necessarily have to go through ordinance setting and, and things like that. And what I also noticing is how, um, you know, our equity uh, commission or equity department has a lot of um, impact, you know, that we're, we're you know, we, it's a million dollar department with staff and everything. And what we really need in relationship to this taxi, I'm getting to the point, to the taxi issue is a climate 
crisis action team that has the same kind of a comparable power that our equity has. You know, so we look through these lenses. And when we're talking about the taxi issue, a lot of it is in regard to you know the competition from the uh, Uber and Lyft uh, companies, and I'm sure there's issues that the taxi people are trying to get you know economic standing. And I think the issue that I'm saying as we look through at a climate lens to our taxis, well, they're fossil fuel based. And that's where our transportation has to be decarbonized in order for us to have a, they say that we need 50% reduction in the next 10, well, it's not even 10 years anymore. It's like eight years to 2030. And we're, you know things have gotten so much worse and the tipping points are, are tipping all over the place um, that we are you know very destabilized as a, as a species. And so, these, these decisions that the science is saying, 50% reduction uh, in all of our you know, issues, especially our transportation is one of our major ones um, that we need to you know, require that all these vehicles be fossil fuel free. Now they could you know, be electric or they could be pedicabs or you know, things like that, that we, you know, the way that they do it with their bicycle, like downtown and, and, and well, we'll say, well, how do they go far? Well, the thing is we need to stay home. We need to not go far. And so these are the limitations of a, a, car, a decarbonized society. We have to start living more hyper-local. Thank you. Uh, Sayum? Sayum? Yeah, can you hear me? Loud and clear. OK. My name is Sayum. I'm from Green Cap. Uh, I would like to make a, a recommendation in supporting uh, Mayor Lacardo's and uh, Council Member Paralysis uh, memo and recommendation. Uh, but uh, I would like particularly want to ask uh, Council Member Paralysis on recommendation number one, this is directed to the staff. Instead of just directed to the staff, if we have a joint committee of staff and industry members, uh, we could have come up with a better result for the council to approve. We have uh, an experience in late 90s, early 2000, we used to have what is called taxi task force, which uh, came up with a good recommendation, which sustained the taxi industry now, but, uh, with the competition from uh, TNC and on the top of that, uh, with the COVID, the taxi industry is, is a miracle, especially green car is still in business. So we need an overhaul of the taxi industry uh, rules, which has been adapted in the 60s. It doesn't fit this time at all. So we need a big change. So I would like one of you to amend that there should be a joint committee of industry and the staff to come up with some recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, person with the number ending 9327. Yeah. Yeah, this is Shakur you guys can hear me? Loud and clear. All right. Good afternoon, leaders of the city. My name is Shakur Bune. I'm representing the San Jose Taxi Drivers Association. I'm here to support the memo from uh, the mayors and uh, council member Raul Perias, which is the right thing to do to save the companies that, they, you know, the insurance right now they put on them, they cannot afford to pay double of that. It's almost 200%. So as a city charter, we the drivers believe if the companies are closed, they were before 18 companies. We just have only three companies left, Yellow Cab, Green Cab, and American Cab. So if we lose them, we don't have no affiliation to anybody. So our the left, you know, couple hundred drivers will lose their jobs too. What also I have uh, to ask, uh, if Raul right now is there, maybe Council, council Member uh, Raul, respectfully, if he can amend it for the drivers, we used to pay $168 uh, 
fee for renewal of the permit of city of San Jose Police Department. Two months ago, they put it the renewal 350. And people who coming back from COVID for the last two years were unemployed. They came back right now with association and they telling us the city is asking, uh, the permit unit is asking them $700 to get back their per permit. Somebody who was 18 months unemployed and the permit he used to pay $158, all the sudden came to 700 They are telling us we're not going to come back to the taxi. We go TNC. They don't pay. Thank you, uh, Larry. Okay, I'm hoping you can hear me now. Loud and clear. I, good. Larry Silva here, Yellow Checker Cab Company. Um, listen, I, I, I put in a couple, uh, sent in a couple memos via the clerk's office. I hope you have had an opportunity to read that. Um, obviously, the most important issue that we're discussing today has to do with the insurance, which from our understanding has a November 1st deadline. Um, and yeah. as so, unless this, this committee and whatever the proper channels are to move this forward happen within the next week, um, we likely would lose two of the cab, two of the three cab companies in the city. So I'm asking you to concentrate on that. Um, we would love to get together and discuss the other remaining issues and business opportunities that we have that we're unable to take advantage of. But um, right now, the, the biggest thing is the insurance. And um, we're, of course, all of us are here and unified and available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Blair? Hi, thank you. Uh, good luck in uh, this negotiation process. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, say hi <laughs> to the taxi drivers uh, working on this issue that uh, I used to take taxis a lot uh, 15, 10, 15 years ago in San Jose. And I just wanted to say hi to the work that they do and, and good luck in the efforts uh, on this issue. Thank you. Okay. Um, person with a number ending in 5140. Yeah, there it is. San Jose PD keeping, keeping the working people down as usual, charging more money. They don't charge Uber drivers, do they? They don't charge Lyft drivers. But San Jose PD, man, they want your money. Because I've never met an organization that goes after people's money more than San Jose PD. They want your tax dollars. They want to fine you. They want to regulate you and take in the money. Where is all their? Where is all the money that SJPD takes in for all their little cheesy police cards and all their little stupid things that they do? They should be ashamed of themselves. They should be ashamed of themselves of what of how they how they take money from hardworking people when they make these big fat salaries. They get to have for the rest of their lives, including lifetime health insurance for them and their partners. Isn't that nice that they get to have that for the rest of their lives? If you ask me, San Jose PD equals glorified welfare. That's what that department is all about. And I feel bad for these taxi cab drivers because Uber and Lyft completely killed their business. How do you guys get off taxing and regulating the hell out of them? Through SJPD, the worst police department in the entire world, what I call the pot department or the pot dealers, because you know they're 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 making sure to shank that money off of the uh, off the drug deals. I mean, that's all they seem to be busting these days is guys with pot, because well, that's their competition. See, see, SJPD is like Uber, right? And the regular Joe the pot man, he's the regular taxi cab guy. Right. It's, th this is what San Jose PD does. They like to keep you down with big smiles and mar marching in parades and doing all the, you know, giving toys to kids. But look at what they really do. They're dirt bags. They should be ashamed of themselves of how that how they police this. City. How should, how should... Thank you, uh, Maria. Hi. Yes. Can everyone, yeah, okay, everyone can hear me. Um, so I just would like to um, speak more about the effects that these regulations have on taxi companies. So as it was mentioned, just to get permission to operate, to get the permits through the SJPD, those prices have doubled. So people who are 
just to renew drivers who've been working in this field for 15, 20 years, they're paying double just to be able to work. And that's not without considering, you know, there's of monthly fees for taxi companies for like taxi stand rentals. These are just so that taxi drivers can park in certain areas. Those taxi companies that use th th that those costs are divided within all the taxi companies in the city. They used to be 16 or 18. Now it just remains about three or four. So those costs are now dispersed between those four companies. And just, I just really want to um, reiterate how disastrous raising the insurance uh, policy limit would be because there's already very few companies, insurance companies who will work with taxi companies. So it's, we're seeing it as a 250% increase, but it could truly be more because companies who know that there is no other market for us could very well increase their price increase their prices and could really, if it's 10,000 or more than $10,000 per vehicle, it just would not be possible for a company, especially a co-op like Green Cab, who is fully sustained by, by its drivers to continue in operation. And um, that is very, um, that would be very difficult. Thank you. Um, that's the end of public comments. Bringing it back to the committee, Councilmember Perales, go ahead. Thank you very much, um, Vice Mayor, and appreciate the um, early consideration form from from staff on this. Um, and uh, wanted to just address one portion of that. So, in the early consideration. Um, form on, on being greenlit, the recommendation states that the police department staff will research, research industry standards and work with the city attorney's office staff to review and respond to color scheme options. Uh, that's one. And then number two, in regards to the meter requirements. The only thing I would ask, because I know that what is really the concern here is, is how um, unfair, I guess, the restrictions are between TNCs and taxi industry. And we've seen some changes in the taxi industry happen slowly, but I don't know if it's necessarily industry standard at this point. I do know if you look at TNCs, it is industry standard there in regards to, you know, there is no color scheme. You can drive whatever color uh, car you you own. Um, and so I, I just, I, I don't want to necessarily have staff simply just take a quick look at, you know, uh, what taxi industry standards are and call it a day and say that, um, that you know, we wanna stick with the, the same color schemes. I'd like to actually look at um, something that is making the environment more fair and, and, and tying it more closely to what TNCs have as regulations. And so while you're looking at industry standards, I would just say that we should be including both taxis and TNCs. So that's my, um, my main concern there. I know there was a request from one of the taxi drivers to have a, um, more of like a joint body, which would include the taxi drivers. My initial guess would be that to, to get to that level of engagement, um, that would take uh, significantly more staff time. But I'll, I'll ask you to respond, Lee, to say, is that something that you think is feasible? Or am I correct in thinking that if we went to that route, um, that might then change your early consideration form? Yeah, I, I think I'd, I wouldn't say that it would change the form, but I'd want to actually meet with staff and better understand what that looks like. Um, I certainly think we would be engaging at some level, um, but a very formal kind of structured process could obviously change uh, parts of this form to a yellow yes. Okay, I, I, I was assuming you would be reaching out anyway, so as long as we can make that as a commitment that you will sure. be engaging um we do only have uh right the, the three companies left is, and and potentially on the verge of, of losing a couple so um i think there's not as many to reach out to at, at this point in time um but as long as you can commit to that i'm fine with not making any other request um and then just asking um that we uh we move forward um with the recommendation from the mayor and i and the response form from uh, staff thank you all Thanks, right, got a motion and a second. Uh, go ahead, Councilmember Cohen. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, Councilmember Paulus and the mayor for bringing this forward. It's a, it's an issue that 
is really important, I think, to the um, economic viability of our airport, to our community, and to a lot of these folks who have um, been in this business. And it's been frustrating to me to see the, the, our taxi industry fading away. I think it's really important to have that as a competitive part of our of our marketplace there. Um, I try to use taxis as much as possible because it's they've been driven out of uh, business by these, these new competitors and we need to figure out how to make the playing field more level. So I, I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you for that. And, and I wholeheartedly support this effort. Thank you. I totally agree. Uh, the taxi uh, industry has been at a competitive disadvantage and we should do every, anything and everything possible to try to level the playing field and have them not only survive, but prosper. So I, I totally support that. All right, uh, Tony. Arenas. Yes. Owen. Uh, Davis. Yes. Corrales. Yes. Jones. Yes. Thank you. All right, next is an update to the August 2021 to June 2022 Community and Economic Development Committee work plan. And I will go to the public first. And Tessa is going to speak to that work plan. Go ahead, Tessa. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Tessa Woodman C. Um, basically, the work plan, from what I looked at it a little bit, was saying that they were looking at the electrical, uh, electric um, signage. That was one of the things that was in the work plan. And uh, I guess it was some, it was also to do with the environmental transportation, the environment committee issues. And um, so, but basically in regards to that work plan, in regards to uh, the signage, that needs to go away. I mean, we do need to really not have those as a distraction, as a you know promotion of consumerism, as a you know fossil fuel using uh, uh, um, signage, we don't need electric signs for that reason. Um, even though we say you know City San Jose runs on you know pure clean energy, but it really doesn't. And you know there's no vi there's no real um, access into how clean our our energy is. And most of the energy uh, you know with our clean energy, so called, is not clean. So you know. Um, so basically, that's one issue with those those billboards. And then the work plan for the transportation and the environment, you know, needs in general um, to be much more dealing with our problems. That that's what I've been really working at is this this deep hole that comes when there's a problem in our in our neighborhood that is a safety issue. And you know, if we can't, how can we say that we're really about Vision Zero when we don't address the issues that are dangerous in our community and fix those. That needs to be put into that work plan is that we need to have a bucket where a complaint comes in and if there's a you know an injury or a potential injury, it needs to be raised to urgent and we need to fix those things. That needs to be the work plan is that we need to make our streets safer walking and bicycling. And when issues come up, they need to be fixed and not put all right, uh, the person with the number any in 5140. This I got to see work, work from the city council. I get nervous when I hear that you guys are working at anything. Speaking of work, where's Pam Foley today? Off working at a real estate office? Trying to, you know, fix a real estate deal? Anyway, Vision Zero. I vote no. It's just another way to control you. It's another way just to have more cops generating revenue for the city versus fighting or solving real crime, which, by the way, hey, San Jose PD, I'd like one of you guys to call in and tell me about a crime that's been solved. And I don't mean catching a guy with some marijuana or somebody jaywalking or an open container or anything like that. This city needs to get back to policing overnight, solving crime preventing crime, not not trying to gold brick the taxi cab drivers or the pot. The excuse me, pot excuse me. Sorry for interrupting, but it's, it's a, the item is related to dropping uh, the electronic billboards item from the work plan. Oh, yeah. Get rid of that, too. 
more billboards that tell me what to do, like get vaccinated or like Tessa says, oh, San Jose, we're the most environmental place. on I don't need you guys to broadcast that with the electricity 24 hours a day. Who cares what you people have to tell us, right? Because we hear it enough through the news, and I listen to these meetings, and I can't imagine anything that you guys have to say is worth anything, especially on one of these electronic reader boards that's an eyesore, that's a distraction, and we're, we're so concerned about energy usage, and this whole world supposed for you guys is supposed to be on some kind of magical electric grid with renewable energy. That's all we need is an electronic sign. Please no electronic signs. They're stupid. It's a waste of energy. And if we're going to be on an all right, bringing it back to the committee, uh, Councilmember Pross, I see your hands raised. Yeah, just a quick question uh, based on the memo I'm seeing. The notice of intended award that information is expected to come out November, meaning uh, we will know, and then obviously the the awardees will find that out as well. Do do we have a estimated time in November, early, mid, late? Um, good afternoon, Council Member Perellis and uh, Rules Committee Blog is well to the Office of Economic Development. Um, I'm shooting to try to get that out uh, probably by mid mid November before the holidays. Okay, that was it. Thank you. Okay, I'll make uh, a motion to approve um, uh, the change. Thanks. Thank you. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Um, Tony, Arenas, yes. Cohen, uh, Cohen. Hi. Thank you, Davis. Yes. Perales. Yes. Jones. Yes. Thank you. Okay, the next item, update to the August 2021 to June 2022 Transportation and Environment Committee work plan. I am going to go to the public. First speaker is going to be Tessa, and Tessa, you're going to speak to dropping the residential garbage and... So go, go ahead, Tessa. Oh, okay, good. Thank, thank you. Yeah, residential garbage. And I'm not sure exactly what that means exactly in regards to dropping the residential garbage. But the issue that I have with our residential plan uh, about garbage is, uh, one, we're not collecting our compost, our, 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 our food waste, and our, you know, we do our yard waste, we're not doing food waste. So we really need to get onto that that it needs to be a, a law that we compost. Um, you know, in Vancouver, they require everybody to, um, Vancouver, I think it's, it's really Canada, but, um, but basically they, they require everybody to compost and also to collect their leaves and have that be part of our compost. So that, that needs to be a change in regards to our, our, our garbage. And, you know, of course we have these diesel trucks coming down our streets, you know, polluting and with horrible backup beepers that need to be changed should be broadband that is a good neighbor backup beeper. But that, you know, getting back to the um, garbage and, and issues, then we have this whole campaign of kick it to the curb. And, you know, you know, and basically that's how we think about our garbage is kick it to the curb. We know who knows where it really goes and let's just kick it to the curb. And we need to do like Santa Clara does and, and um, to do where we put our stuff out for reuse and, and people could, you know, rummage through it and one person's garbage is another person's, you know, valuable thing. And so we need to do that and, and have that go forward and, and use the best practices of other cities and other communities to, to guide us as we go forward. And that would solve a lot, of, you, know, you know, even having the truck come to pick up our stuff. And so many valuable things have been thrown into the garbage. And, and so we need to at least have that program like Santa Clara to um, have people look through it and then do the pickup and, and try to reduce our waste as, as much as possible to be zero waste and have education on that. Thank you, Blair. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. This item, uh, the memo seems to offer that um, staff requests to drop the report on residential garbage and recycling rates 
from the November 1st uh, T &E, uh, committee uh, to allow staff to gather more waste collection data and identify potential data irregularities due to the impact of COVID-19. So I, I guess for myself, um, they'll, they're gonna do a garbage recycling rate report uh, in May, 2022 instead. Um, so will this, will this be the sort of item that new AI uh, ideas will be needed uh, to be considered about this fall that I've heard so much about and I've been trying to talk about? I'm, I'm not all that knowledgeable, but I try to bring out, you know, how these sort of practices can be talked about uh, openly and to be... Um, I don't know, informational and, and, and everyday community can, can learn how to, to ask questions about these sort of uh, data collection and, and, and data irregularities due to the impact of COVID-19 within our garbage rates and, and our garbage uh, uh, collection issues. Uh, where subsidies can be uh, applicable, I hope uh, you know it can be an open subject matter and that uh, you know there, there can be open conversation about such subjects and um, their rates. Um, overall, I guess that's about all I can um, offer at this time. And uh, good luck to the ideas of openness. Thank you. All right. The person with the number ending in five one four zero. It seems like garbage rates. You guys have them so hidden, you know, in the within the property taxes. Same with water. You know, it's, you you guys are too afraid to show the general public what it really costs. You want it, you don't want it to be known, so you bury it, right? And we recycle quite a bit uh, in this valley. I mean, it's it, it's one of the number one places where people actually follow the rules and recycling. And we're doing it, and to the point that some of the recyclable material is, you know, goes down in value because there's such a volume of it. I, and people say that's bad. I say that's good because at least it's going someplace versus landfill. You can't have trash uh, or solid waste that po pollutes your water table. And we could go on and on and on about, you know, we don't really realize how you manage trash. It's actually very hard to do. But at, when it comes to the cost and the regulation of everything, the city, uh, you know, how much more do we have to recycle and how much more are our garbage rates going to go up and our water rates? So you guys just sit back and let it happen. You must be getting kickbacks for this. Uh, I'm not saying that you are, but uh, it, it seems like it based on the rates that we pay some of the highest in the nation. Someone's getting paid somewhere. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me uh, what goes on under the table uh, for, for, you know, this type of stuff, water and garbage. Keep in mind the mafia, still to this day, that's their main, their main source of income in, in Europe or in Sicily and whatnot, is garbage and water. Uh, and there's a reason why they were involved in it in the United States. And now it's just been taken over by corporations and, and regulated uh, poorly by city councils. It's pretty clear what's going on. I mean, we take a look at that building over there for the water. All right, that's the end of public comments. Bring it back to the committee. Councilmember Perales. I apologize, that was from before. Oh, okay. Councilmember Davis. Thank you. I just wanted uh, to respond to one of the public commenters. We don't need to compost our food because it actually gets recovered through our garbage. I'm just channeling Kerry Romanow now. He has the chair of T&E for almost two years. I know that she would want me to say that. So we we don't have to compost our, uh, our food waste because it actually gets recovered through our regular garbage system. And then of course, um, our recyclables are recovered through, through the uh, recyclable bin. So with that, I will move the amendment to the work plan. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, Tony? 
Arenas. Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Rawlis? Yes. Jones? Aye. Thank you. Okay, on to open forum. First public speaker is Tessa. Okay. Well, I guess the most important issue, because I say that all climate action is local action, and I'm, I'm so impressed with our neighbors that a lot of people are speaking up against hotels. And this is Deb Davis's plan, where, you know, which is part of the whole economic growth jobs plan for our city. And that we have to really, uh, first of all, people aren't you know, even wanting to take these jobs. Our jobs are, are risking our lives. So people are dropping out of the workforce. And the thing is, is that we do need to refocus on all of our crises. And that is our housing and our, cli our climate crisis, really. That is the biggest thing. And so basically what I've been saying is that, you know, and, and you're hearing it over and over that people are mad about not being um, addressed about the, what they want in their community. And, and, we, and you keep pushing, you know, a commercial development. And this is a problem. And, and hotels everywhere. And, and then, like I say, you know, the hotels, the state of California is telling you to get the hotels. They need to be housing. And we need to listen to the state of California. They've been telling you this in, in, in general, that our, ho our housing needs to be by transit. And yet you put a hotel in my very walkable neighborhood, you know, that is a you know, resilient neighborhood because so many of the resources are here. So bad planning on the part of our city. And so there, there, that property is available to be bought and developed to, to, to address our housing issue, which is a crisis right now with Columbus Park. And we need to move those people. And that's good. So we could buy that property, develop housing for the homeless, and, and, in, and then have a 24-7 um, living environment. That's how things change. With teachers to teach, uh, teach all the recipients to live fossil fuel free and, and waste free and plastic free. And to become vegans, we have to become vegans. So there's a lot for us to learn. We can get money from a lot of reasons. Okay. Uh, Blair? Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, thanks for the meeting today. Uh, a quick reminder, uh, Tessa offered some nice words about, you know, the future of the sub subcommittee process. Uh, with the reimagined task force, uh, uh, Community Safety Commission, uh, what is it, a COVID-19 economic forum and the uh, equity roundtable, all coming up in the next six months. Uh, I hope it can be really considered the importance of uh, public accessibility to the uh, subcommittee process and ways to develop that, uh, I hope can be taking place. Uh, we had a difficult May and, and so, you know, the good democratic practices didn't run, really wanna be worked on very much. Uh, hopefully we can be more open to, to those good ideas and good community democratic practices at this time. Good luck how we can work on this issue. Um, an apology and a thank you uh, for just months of patience with yourselves. Also with the issues of how I talk about uh, earthquake in, in possibly in the next uh, few years and in the next decade. I try to talk about it in terms of wildfire, in terms of uh, sea level rise and, and, and other natural disasters we have to be preparing for uh, in the Bay Area in the next few years. But I do focus that we have to consider how we can more openly talk about planning issues that I think can be of help. But boy, if I'm wrong, I, I hope I can learn to talk to yourselves and I've been writing yourselves a few times and you can write back, uh, what, what exactly can we expect in the next few years? I think it can develop a better public comment time and an overall better, uh, you know, public process that I think uh, would be innovative and just gosh darn nice to be able and helpful to be able to talk to each other about these things more openly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michael, go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. Or five one four zero. Uh, 
Thanks. Thanks for, uh, you know, letting me speak. Tony hit, cut me off a couple times yesterday. I think you guys did today, too. You guys don't want to hear the truth, and that's okay, because I'm the reality. You may not think it, but I am. And the way you guys run this city council, it's a disgrace. It really is. You guys are going towards a leftist politics. You're going to by, we're going by the way of Venezuela. It's going to happen. We're going to run out of money because there's no way you're going to be able to generate these types of revenues and pay all your city workers, cops and firemen, everybody, all this money and give everything to everybody. It's not going to work. It's, it's a bad idea. They're bad idea. You guys have bad ideas, bad planning, bad implementation, and all you want to do is fine and regulate and tell people what to do, thinking it's going to work. It's not. It's not going to work. You guys are failures, every single one of you, even the people who I like, you guys are failures, and you know it. It's not – your ideas are, are, are antiquated. They're antiquated, and, it's, and what you're doing is destroying the fabric of this city and this country. The way – you guys are following the party line out of D.C., which is completely wrong, and it, 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 show, it shows. It shows. Look at the potholes. Look at the burned out buildings. Look at how poorly this city is run. You're running this like a third world nation. A lot of people on top with money, nobody in between, and promising people in poverty everything. It's not going to work. And I don't know why you people can continue to make the same stupid mistakes day after day. I'd like to see a response to what I all right, then. That is the last public comment. This meeting is adjourned.